soon. Okay, so thank you, Mihaela, for the invitation to talk in your uh, in this uh, series of lectures, and um, welcome to all who have uh, joined. Thank you very much for taking your time. Uh, let me share my screen first and start with the presentation. Um, just a second. Um, just now, I think. Um, I, was, I, I forgot to say, please unmute your micos and at the end, you are welcome to address your questions either by raising your hand or, um, or by sending a short message in the chat or by addressing or by writing down your question in the chat area. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Right. So... Um, my talk today will uh, concern one apocryphal text attributed to the Virgin uh, Mary or about the Virgin Mary, specifically about the end of her life, which contains also a section on, um, on contains an apocalypse and the tour of the other world. Uh, I would like to add right at the beginning two caveats to my talk. So the first one is that in the abstract I sent around, I also mentioned that I would talk about Enoch and Elijah. Uh, however, because of um, time, I decided not to include uh, a section on, on these two figures who are important in, in this uh, specific text. And the second caveat is that I'm quite new to the field of Apocrypha. I uh, mainly work on ascetic and uh, mystical literature and on monasticism. However, it was really my work on these ascetic and monastic um, traditions that led me to this text. And this is why I would like to briefly present something about my ongoing project, which is also the framework in which the, the current investigation is, uh, is being done. So as Mihaela said, I'm currently a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Vienna. My host here is Professor Claudia Rapp. And um, the... Sorry, excuse me. The, the aim of my project here is to create a database of ascetic manuscripts from Palestine and Sinai uh, from, for the period 600 to 1100 roughly. Uh, this database will contain detailed descriptions of manuscripts with ascetic content, uh, apophthegmata, letters, treatises, and so on that have been produced or circulated in, in the Sinaitic Palestinian area. Uh, my focus will be on the selections of texts in these manuscripts, but also on the owners, scribes, on the circulation and so on. At the moment, the database is planned to contain uh, Greek, Syriac and Arabic manuscripts, but hopefully at a later stage, I will also include uh, Georgian and CPA uh, manuscripts. Um, the database will hopefully be launched in about a year or less than a year from now. And I'm really thankful for the cooperation and help I'm receiving from Slavomir Cepo and David Mikkelsen. So within this um, framework and working on these manuscripts, I've also encountered, uh, of course, collections where you don't have only ascetic and mystical texts, but also apocrypha. And I find this combination of texts quite interesting. And we will see later on why such a database and why looking at this material from, from such a perspective might help us understand something about the reception of apocrypha in, in general and about the apocryphon of the mother of God in particular. So um, the, this is the outline of the talk. Um, today, first, I will give a brief overview of the apocalypses of the Virgin, the four different texts that are known under this name. In the second part, I will then focus on the six books on the Dormition, uh, looking at the earliest manuscripts, and also at, at the until now neglected aspect of uh, the earliest redaction of this text that we have. Um, something that I've called here an imminent eschatology that is uh, transparent in this text. Um, then moving on to the, to the reception of the six books in the later period, I will look at the palimpsests that contain this text and their later users and move on to the earliest extant Arabic translations of, um, of the six books. And we will look at some interesting changes uh, and changing perceptions of the text. This is why I, the title of my talk is, is Syriac and Arabic readers of Apocrypha. So these readers have creatively 
um, modified or creatively uh, received these, these texts. And in the concluding section, I would like to open the discussion to as, as to why uh, possibly these changes have been made and what this can tell us about the larger context in which such texts were copied and transmitted. So the overview uh, here is uh, taken mostly from the study of Richard Bockham on these traditions. As you'll know, the most famous apocalypse of the Theotokos is the one uh, preserved in Greek, um, or one uh, written in Greek and extant also in Armenian, Georgian, Church Slavonic, and Old Romanian. Um, and as we learned from Peter Toth earlier this year, also in Latin. Uh, however, there, in some secondary literature, I also found the um, information that this apocalypse was translated into Arabic, Syriac, Coptic, and Ethiopic. However, I think this is simply a misunderstanding, or it, it conflates this text, the first apocalypse, and the other three, which are unrelated to the first. Um, the second one is an Ethiopic apocalypse of the Virgin, which is uh, extant only in Ethiopic and is probably uh, a later production, late medieval production. And the last two apocalypses are the most interesting ones, in my opinion. Um, in any case, they are the earliest uh, apocalyptic texts of the Virgin, and they are both integrated in um, books on the Dormition. Uh, the obsequious apocalypse is um, preserved fully only in an Ethiopic translation, but we have fragments in Georgian and Syriac uh, dating to the 5th, 6th centuries, and later adaptations in, in Latin, Old Irish, and other languages. And the last apocalypse is the one that we'll be looking at in more detail, the six books. Um, this is also preserved in uh, Syriac, Arabic, and Ethiopic in full. And quite recently, there have been also discoveries of two different Sogdian versions of this text, and I'll come to those two later on. Um, only a brief remark on earlier scholarship on these apocalypses. As you all know, the Greek apocalypse of the Virgin is the one that has been uh, studied most, I think, of these four, already at the beginning of the, or already in the mid 19th century. We have comparative studies of this uh, apocalypse in uh, Slavonic, Greek, and Old Romanian, such as in the uh, in this comparative synoptic edition of uh, Bogdan Petriceko Hajdeo. And recently we, all, we also have a critical edition based on the earliest manuscript, the Autobonianus Grecus I by Olena Sirtsova, and the monographic study that discusses this apocalypse and other related texts and their reception in, in Byzantium. So this first text is quite well studied, although there are still many aspects that would have to be um, studied in the future as well. In, with regard to the relationship between this Greek apocalypse and the other three texts, there have been some diverging views in scholarship. So for instance, uh, Simon Mimouni in his 1993 article seems to say that the Greek apocalypse is, derives from the same apocalypse that we have in the Dormition narratives, um, and that it was later detached in the Byzantine context and was transmitted in, as a separate text. But as uh, Richard Bockham and Stephen Shoemaker have um, noted, this view is simply wrong because the four texts are, are, dif are four different uh, apocalypses. They are distinct. They do have some shared um, elements, which some of which go back to the uh, Apocalypse of Paul. But I think it's best to look at these four texts as, as four separate or four distinct entities. Um, however, more recently in 2016, Shoemaker also argued that perhaps the obsequious apocalypse, the one preserved only, the one preserved in Ethiopic, might actually have influenced indirectly at least the composition of the Greek apocalypse and also of the apocalypse of Paul. The, Date and provenance uh, are also um, quite debat debated in scholarship. Um, the Greek apocalypse has been variously dated to 500 to 1100. Most scholars, however, argue for a Middle Byzantine um, composition. As I said, the Ethiopic uh, apocalypse is a late medieval production, most likely. 
possibly locally written in Ethiopia, but possibly also copied from and translated from an Arabic, lost Arabic original. And the last two, the ones integrated in the in these permission narratives, are certainly the earliest. Um, both the obsequious and the six books are extant in manuscripts that date to the sixth century at the latest, which um, places their composition, their original composition, certainly before the year 500. Um, and with regard to the various relate to the chronology of these texts, uh, Richard Bockham suggested, for instance, that the six books was the earliest apocalypse, um, followed by the obsequious, then by the apocalypse of Paul, which Bockham says was influenced by the two apocalypses, um, by the two earlier apocalypses, and then the apocalypse of Paul in turn influenced the later Greek and Ethiopic uh, texts. I haven't seen, I'm not an expert on the apocalypse of Paul, but I haven't seen a refutation of this uh, genealogy that Bockham proposes, so that in fact the two Dormition apocalypses influenced the, the apocalypse of Paul. I'll be glad to discuss this in, in the Q&A if, if you know anything about this. And uh, Shoemaker makes, makes a similar argument in his uh, 2016 publication. Now, if we uh, look a bit comparatively at the, at the four apocalypses, we notice that there's, uh, there are quite a few similarities, but also differences between uh, them. Um, so I've, I've put together these categories and you can see that there are various aspects that differ and some other aspects are common. So uh, for example, of course, the obsequious and the six books place the vision of heaven and hell after Mary's dormition, whereas in the first two apocalypses, she is still alive. Um, she is guided by Christ in most of them, but in, in the Greek apocalypse, she's guided by the Archangel Michael. She can be either alone or um, accompanied by prophets or, or, the, or the Archangel Michael. It's also interesting to look what the tour actually consists of. So in some uh, variants, we have detailed descriptions of, uh, of the punishments, of some punishments in hell, um, of paradise, of the exit of the soul, but this is not something common to all four texts. There's also uh, a concern with Marian intercession. Uh, most famously in the Greek apocalypse, there's this intercession that Mary uh, makes so that the sinners punished in hell receive a, a respite, time of respite between Easter and Pentecost. Um, we have similar um, acts of intercession in the other texts, but for a much shorter period. So uh, Sundays usually, or some hours of, of Sunday. And finally, as I said, the first two um, apocalypses always, were always transmitted separately, whereas the, uh, the latter two are always part, and all the manuscripts are, they are always part of the, of the Dormition narrative. Um, now let's have a closer look at the six books uh, of, on the Dormition. Um, this is based on Van Esprek's uh, genealogy of the various uh, texts belonging to the tradition of, uh, of Dormition narratives. Van Esprek uh, categorizes the six books as um, being part of this larger Bethlehem and Sensings tradition. There are some problems with this genealogy, but for our purposes, it's enough to, to see that the six books um, are at the foundation or are at the very origin of this entire tradition. So they've been quite influential in the latter um, elaborations on, on these um, texts about the Dormition. In some cases, the six books on the Dormition are integrated into larger biographies of the Virgin, which included the Proto-Gospel proto of James, the Infosting Gospel of Thomas, and the six books. There's also an interesting aspect which we will consider in more detail in, in a few minutes, namely there is a preface attached to these six books, or it's actually part of the first book, uh, which recounts the discovery of this book about Mary's Dormition. In most uh, versions, this discovery is placed in Ephesus. Uh, however, in the Sogdian uh, translation, it's placed in Constantinople. And uh, I'll have something to say about this later on. Um, 
And the most important thing for our purposes is to note that the earliest manuscripts of the six books date to the early sixth century. Uh, they might integrate older material or they might go back to some lost Greek originals uh, of the fourth or third centuries uh, or so, but the two redactions that we have today in the manuscripts must date to uh, the first half of the sixth century. Here's a oh, brief overview of the basic structure. So the, this book on the Dormition is divided into six distinct uh, books. The first one is this preface about the discovery. The second book it begins with an angel announcing uh, Mary's death. The apostles are brought to Jerusalem. They go to Bethlehem. Uh, book three then contains a series of miraculous healings. Uh, there's a prolonged conflict and uh, dialogue with the Jews of Jerusalem. And there's also an interesting legend of the discovery of the cross integrated in this book. Book four is then the Dormition scene itself. Christ comes from heaven to take Mary's soul. And there are some liturgical instructions about how Mary should be commemorated uh, three times a year. And then finally, books five and six are the actual apocalypse, uh, as it were, the, the tour of heavens and hell, which includes this intercession of Mary and her instructions to John. Now, I've, I've said that we have two redactions going back to the early sixth century. Uh, it's in fact quite remarkable that we have at least six different manuscripts from the sixth century with this text which is, I think, uh, except for biblical texts, is, is quite rare. And um, these six manuscripts can be divided into, roughly divided into two redactions. Perhaps there's, there are some subcategories of that, but um, in, in any case, the four manuscripts that belong to the second redaction, as you see here, are all palimpsests. And uh, one might say that this is just a coincidence, but I think we'll, uh, we'll see later on that this, uh, there might be something more to this. Um, now, the, second the first redaction, R1, extant in two manuscripts of the sixth century, uh, cont um, contains or excludes some episodes that are found in the second one. And uh, these differences, the differences between these two redactions are uh, quite revealing as we will see. And indeed, one of these details that is only found in the second redaction in the palimpsests uh, has been strangely ignored so far, or at least I couldn't find any uh, discussion of this in, in scholarship. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but already uh, Agnes Lewis's um, edition of the Mingana Lewis palimpsest, which contains the six books, contains this very strange um, reference to a year, the year 809. And then there's this small lacuna in the manuscript. I mean, she couldn't uh, decipher what the text said. And perhaps because of this lacuna, scholars ignored uh, this passage saying that perhaps it's, it's not complete. In any case, it's this, it has discouraged um, research into what the meaning of this year might be. Um, fortunately, Thanks to the Sinai Palimpsest project, and uh, also thanks to Grigory Kesso, whom I uh, warmly thank again for uh, pointing me to the undertext in this manuscript. The same passage is preserved in full in the, in the lower layer of Sinai Arabic 588. So now we can reconstruct uh, and um, understand somewhat better what the context of that year uh, is. So I'm going to read the translation based on, the, on this new uh, palimpsest, so the unpublished palimpsest. Um, and I quote, in the year 809, in the month Kanun the first, on the day of the nat nativity of Christ, when the high and low beings stand and praise the day of Christ's birth, Lady Mary appeared to Mar John in Ephesus and said to him, the book you have about my departure from this world, give it to the men who are coming to you from Mount Sinai, for the day has come in which your Lord will come from heaven. The book of my departure will uh, go forth, will go out, and so that there may be a commemoration and offering for my sake. For you, John, and the apostles, your companions, came to me to Bethlehem when I passed away. And behold, 
I have informed you that the hour has arrived when he will come to bring about the resurrection to all creatures. And it will be shown regarding my glory, how I departed from the world. Um, before looking at the date uh, more closely, um, let me just point out that some of the um, things that Mary tells John in, in this preface um, echo, find a parallel in book six. At the end of book six, after her tour of heaven and hell, Mary uh, tells John everything that she saw. And then she says, take heed to me in these words, which your Lord has shown me that at the time which I shall reveal to you, I say to you, books and writings shall be issued about my victories when there shall be commemorations and offerings to me until the time when your Lord shall come from heaven. Because many shall be the distresses of mankind and the sore afflictions that shall scorch the earth when there shall be fearful signs and wars shall multiply and so on. So, um, in, in fact, we have at the end of book six, this um, statement by Mary that at the end of time or shortly before the end of time, she will reveal uh, this book to John and then to the whole world. So clearly the authors of the preface who mentioned the year 809 believed that this was the time for the books to be relieved, um, re revealed, sorry, and that this um, happened closely or shortly before the uh, last judgment or before the end of, of time. So this is why I call the um, context of the second redaction uh, as being influenced by an imminent uh, eschatology, by the um, expectation of, an, of the imminent end of the world. And it's really no surprise if we look at the year. So the year 809 clearly refers to the Seleucid era in this context, which in our calendar um, corresponds to the 25th of December, 497. This cannot be a, co a coincidence. Clearly it has to do with uh, what scholars have called the fear of the year 500. Um, present in the Eastern Mediterranean and based on the fact that according to some world chronologies, um, either the year 499, 500 or the year 507, 8, according to the Alexandrian world era, coincided with the year 6000 Anomundi. And based on the belief that uh, a year uh, or a day equals 1000 years, um, some believe that the advent of the year 6000 coincided with the end of uh, the world. And indeed in this period, uh, which falls in the reign of Anastasius I, we have this war, this war between Persia and Byzantium. We have um, chroniclers mentioning famines and uh, droughts and other catastrophes in Syria and Palestine. Uh, we have, of course, the religious upheavals following the Council of Chalcedon and so on. So, I think this makes it quite clear that the message of the six books in its uh, second redaction uh, that I mentioned is quite clear. The end of the world is imminent. Mary can intercede for the ones living in these last times and they, that she should be honored uh, in a proper manner. That's why they, are, they have this, uh, these liturgical uh, instructions. And not only that, uh, as you remember, the text says, books and writings shall be issued about my victories. And this may be taken as a metaphor, but considering the fact that we have four palimpsests or four manuscripts dating from the early 6th century, I think this points to a conscious effort to disseminate uh, the six books um, and its liturgical program across the Syriac speaking world and perhaps even, even beyond. So this is the initial setting, the initial context in which we have our uh, earliest layer, our, our earliest stratum of the, of the six books. And in this context, it, the tour of afterlife also receives a specific uh, meaning. Um, Mary sees the just and the wicked waiting, awaiting the last judgment and awaiting to receive their rewards and punishments. So it's not just a tour of the afterlife, but it's also um, an anticipation of what would soon occur. Now, already in the sixth century, this redaction with its apocalyptic, with, with its eschatological um, focus, uh, 
uh, falls out of use. And one can think of several reasons for this, of course. First, the first would be the uh, quote-unquote apocalyptic embarrassment. So since the end of the world didn't come around the year 500, uh, this type of prophecy would have become obsolete. It could also be that the theological liturgical uh, program failed to attract uh, sufficient followers. Reconciliation between Chalcedonians and its opponents also became increasingly difficult. Um, but also, as we will see, the, there, another explanation may be that there were changing interests and sensibilities regarding to this type of prophecies or this type of literature. And finally, another reason could be that, as I said, the six books soon were, were soon integrated into lives of the Virgin. And in that context, the aim of these lives was more to provide the full biography of the Virgin and not to predict the end of the world or anything like that. Well, as I said, we can glean some information about the later reception by looking at the palimpsests themselves, these four palimpsests and their later users. And we notice a few interesting things when, when we do that. So the earliest reuse of a uh, six books palimpsest is uh, the Sinai Syriac manuscript number 30, the famous manuscript which contains in its upper text lives of women saints and a whole series of texts in, in the lower um, um, stratum, so pseudo Macarius, biblical text and so on. Uh, this manuscript has usually been dated to 779, although I think there are some reasons to argue for an earlier date, 708. And in any case, it shows uh, it has some user notes in Georgian, which might indicate the circulation in Palestine and Sinai in the 9th and 10th centuries, even though it was produced in, in northwest Syria. Um, and today it is housed, housed uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery. The next two manuscripts are more interesting for our purposes because they both uh, go back to one single scribe um, who reused uh, two palimpsests, two manuscripts of the six books in Syriac to copy texts in Arabic. So the first one is another famous manuscript, Sinai Arabic 514. Uh, you can see the uh, contents here. And the scribe is identified as, um, I mean, he, he has a, there is a colophon and the scribe is identified as uh, Thomas of uh, Fustat, who copied this text on Mount Sinai in the late 9th or early 10th century. So one of the lower texts that he uses to rewrite uh, the manuscript is the six books. And Thomas of Fustat is also the one who copied the probably copied the Mingana Lewis palimpsest as well, which again, in its upper text contains various uh, patristic texts and homilies in Arabic, but the lower texts of which contain partly the Quran, this is why this manuscript is so famous because of the uh, undertext, the Quranic undertext, but the same manuscript also contains fragments of the six books in the same longer uh, redaction that, uh, that we've uh, discussed. So once again, we have a second example of Thomas of Fustat reusing manuscript of the six books for his own uh, ends. And uh, finally, the last one that I already mentioned is somewhat later, but also um, probably from the same region, perhaps dating to the 10th century. Um, this is by an unknown scribe. Now, at the same time that these um, early redaction of the six books fell out of use and was um, forgotten or was uh, considered not that interesting anymore. Uh, we do have, um, it's not that there was no interest in the six books. So we have some evidence that the same period, so beginning in the eighth, early ninth century, um, there is some evidence for um, adaptations of the six books. One of which uh, I could, um, we can, surmise existed in Syriac but is lost. However, we have this Sogdian translation that I mentioned with its very strange um, preface which places the discovery of the six books in Constantinople and not in Ephesus. And I've argued in an article that is forthcoming that uh, this uh, Sogdian fragment discovered in Turfan must go back to a um, pro-Chalcedonian, pro-Constantinopolitan, Melkite Syriac um, rewriting or redaction or whatever of the six books. So there are some changes to the story. Uh, 
including this uh, shift to Constantinople. And this must be placed somewhere in, in Palestine or, or Syria in this period. It's also at the same time in the ninth century that we have the first attestations of the liturgical cycle in the six books being implemented by the various communities, by the various Syriac Christian communities in this region. Um, there's one calendar, Melkite calendar in Syriac that contains some evidence of uh, this liturgical cycle of the six books, meaning uh, end of December, 15th of May and 15th of August uh, into being, uh, being implemented. So clearly there is an interest in, in the book. And finally, also at the same time, we have the earliest attestations of a Christian Arabic version of the six books. Now, this Christian Arabic translation probably dates to the 9th or perhaps early 10th century, extant in two early manuscripts. Um, and this, this very early Arabic translation was later adapted for the use in Menologia, uh, among which most famously the Antiochian Menologia in the late 10th, early 11th century. And later on, it, was, it became very uh, popular in, um, in later liturgical texts so as, a, as a reading for the 15th of August. However, if we look at this early translation more carefully, more closely, the one preserved in the Bryn Mawr manuscript, uh, we find something very interesting. So the manuscript as it stands today is divided between the Mingana collection, Bryn Mawr College and Leiden, Leiden's University Library. Um, and there is a colophon on the first, uh, on, on folio four, saying that this book too was copied by Thomas of Fustat on Mount Sinai. So I think this is a unique case of one individual that we can uh, pin down, that we can identify, who is responsible for the reuse of one text and the copying of the same text in Arabic translation in the same uh, Sinaitic uh, milieu. Um, it's not clear if Thomas actually translated the text into Arabic, but there are some differences um, in the text. So whoever translated the Syriac six books in its early redaction with this uh, mention of the year 809 um, must have had uh, must have had some interest to uh, do some modifications in, in this text and Thomas was aware of this. So um, this is something that uh, I um, came across by working on the, on the Sogdian version, um, but I think it, it deserves more attention in its own right. So as, as we saw, the um, initial Syriac version contains this reference to the year 809, with a clear apocalyptic and eschatological um, um, intention. But then if we shift, if we look to the Arabic translation as preserved in our early manuscript copied by Thomas, um, the year is modified. So there's this um, scene where the writer or the author addresses his brothers saying, Instead of 809, he says, I inform you, brothers, that in the year 319, in the month Canon the first, on the day of the nativity of our Lord, and so on and so on. And then correspondingly later on in the text, when Mary appears to John and tells, tells him about uh, her death, this is now placed in the future. So you, O John, and your companions, the apostles, will come to Bethlehem instead of you came to Bethlehem when I passed away. You will, you will come to Bethlehem when I will depart from the world. And instead of the reference to Christ's second coming, which in the Syriac version clearly refers to the parousia because the text speaks about the resurrection of all creatures. In the Arabic translation, the Lord is only coming, merely coming to take Mary's soul. Um, now, this modification I think goes hand in hand with uh, changed perception about the nature of this text and its function. Um, regardless of the fact that the year 319, according to the um, Seleucid era, doesn't make any sense in the story because it's much too early. 319 corresponds, to, I think, to seven or eight uh, common era uh, when, well, John wasn't in Ephesus. Uh, he was probably still a small child. Um, and this is why later uh, copies of this text, for instance, the ones doing the Arabic Menologion, uh, 
updated uh, or changed the date again to 345, which corresponds to, to 33, 34 AD. But in any case, the translator, whether it was Thomas or somebody else, um, wanted to de-eschatologize in a way the text by removing this reference to the end of the world. One could think of um, other uh, reasons or other options he would have uh, could have employed. For instance, he could have um, updated the year to his own period. And we know that the early Islamic period is not a period that was devoid of apocalyptic uh, or political and historical apocalyptic texts, right? So beginning in the seventh century, we have all these texts, pseudo Ephraim, pseudo Methodius, um, and so on, which try to um, predict the end of the world and the coming judgment. So the translator of, of the six books could have modified the date to suit this uh, sort of political historical purpose. Uh, but the translator chose, uh, chose not to do that. So perhaps our Arabic translator wasn't interested in this type of political prophecy or historical prophecy. Perhaps he was rather interested in the tour, in this uh, genre of tours of the other world. And this is something that, again, finds perils in this period, in the same uh, milieu. So, uh, for example, the earliest copy of the Arabic translation of the Apocalypse of Paul, which is probably the most famous tour of the other world, is also preserved in an Arabic manuscript from Sinai, 461, which was, if not copied by Thomas of Ustad, then most likely by his immediate entourage. And there's another text uh, quite popular uh, that also contains a very interesting tour of the other world, the so-called Apocalypse of Pseudo Gregory. Um, so clearly, while there still was interest in political prophecy and apocalypses, there was also an increased uh, interest in these in this type of tours of the other line, of the afterworld or of the other world. And perhaps our Arabic translation uh, suits or falls into this category. And this is why the translator chose not to um, politicize the text, or he chose rather to de-eschatologize and depoliticize the text. But there are also some other interesting features of the uh, of this Arabic translation. So, for example, and here I also brought to for comparison the uh, obsequious apocalypse, the other early apocalypse uh, tied to an adormition narrative. We see that in the obsequious apocalypse, there is interest in this um, hour of death. So there, you have these two angels who come to take the soul. There are examples of specific sinners, such as the tormented reader, the deacon, the priest, which has perils in the Apocalypse of Paul. There's this uh, insistence on the intercession. Um, but in, in our six book of Apocalypse, neither in Syriac nor in Arabic, we do not have these elements. So the interest or, or the aim of, this, uh, of the six books Apocalypse was not um, to describe the, the torments of hell, was probably not so much interested in the intercession of Mary in the other world. Um, it rather offers a more detailed description of paradise and of the heavenly Jerusalem. So it's not interested in, in of course, the, the just and the unright and the sinners appear in the text. They are described, so there you have the tabernacles of the just and Gehenna. Um, but this section is rather short, and it doesn't give any of those gory details that you find in the in the other uh, in the Apocalypse of Paul or in the Obsequious Apocalypse. Interestingly, also in the Syriac six books, the just and the sinners watch their rewards and punishments from a distance. The text says, whereas in the Arabic translation, uh, this uh, phrase "from a distance" is uh, left out. And one gets the impression that the uh, just and the sinners are, are already experiencing some of the punishments and uh, rewards that they are going to receive after the resurrection. So I haven't uh, really finished yet a systematic comparison of all these tours, but I think there are some really interesting uh, details that uh, one would have to look at. And uh, with this, I will conclude, but um, not before um, pointing to some possible avenues or some possible context where we might 
search for a, let's say, a better context uh, in which this apocalypse might have been copied. So I'm, I refer to the Arabic. Um, first of all, as um, we have already seen, there's this concern, general concern for the, knowing the hour of death and individual judgment. Uh, this is found in many texts, but uh, there is an emphasis on this subject, for instance, in Anastasius of Sinai, in another Sinaitic collection of questions and answers uh, attributed to Athanasius, which was translated into Arabic at a very early stage. We also have various texts about the soul's exit, uh, some of which are in close um, vicinity in the manuscripts to our apocalypse or to other apocalyptic texts. So this is all 9th, 10th century, and apparently there's this uh, increased interest, and we're speaking about the monastic context, so this is uh, quite understandable, an interest in this uh, meditation on death, on the hour of death, and individual judgment, but uh, less interest in the political dimension of, uh, of this type of literature, and also less interest in the specific details of, of what the punishment in hell uh, may be. Another possible avenue is uh, suggested by um, Alexander Golitsyn's approach, by looking at these texts as um, providing some sort of um, forlagged for mystical um, uh, authors interested in mystical visions. So what, what Golitsyn calls this type of Christian Merkava, because we have visions of the throne of God in our apocalypse and also in other texts, there's this emphasis on heavenly Jerusalem. So perhaps monks copying and reading this and translating this were interested in this type of visionary literature. And co a comparative approach I think would be useful here because we have similar developments in, uh, in Islamic and Jewish literature, also in Byzantium and also in, in the West. Um, so speaking about Byzantium, it's been well discussed in scholarship that there's uh, there was also an interest in uh, the end of the world linked to the year 1000, um, most famously discussed by Paul Magdalena, but also others. And we have this series of Middle Byzantine uh, hagiographic texts which contain representations of the other world. And I won't talk about these now, but uh, here's, here's a list and there are also others. So clearly around the 10th century at the latest and also later we have this um, interest in the afterlife in Byzantium, not necessarily tied to eschatological fears or political prophecies, although to some extent they are, but not all of them, and uh, their function does not, is not reduced to being simply a political prophecy. Um, there's this also in interest in creating a, uh, um, in creating menologia and creating uh, authoritative lives of saints. And these visions also play a role in this development. So we could ask ourselves if we can compare or we can connect this type of interest in Byzantium and in the Middle Byzantine period to what we find in the Melkite, Arabic and Syriac uh, communities outside the Byzantine Empire. This is an open question, but I think it's, it's really useful to uh, look at the broader picture. So just to summarize, um, I think it's quite clear that the four apocalypses and especially the last three remain insufficiently studied. Uh, I have argued that the six books is a Syriac, in, in, in the form that we have today, is a Syriac composition, um, which points to an imminent apocalyptic expectations linked to the year 500. However, the later reception of the text was shaped by uh, other interests less by this type of uh, political prophecy or, or predicting the end. Um, rather, um, later readers, as we could see from the Arabic translation, was, were more interested uh, in, uh, in understanding the afterlife, perhaps being interested in personal judgment, visionary mysticism, and, and other aspects. And I think the way to go forward would be to look at how our translation, the Arabic translation of the six books, uh, compares to the other early Arabic translations of Apocrypha in, in this period and in the same Melkite environment in Palestine and Sinai. Uh, 
we should pay closer attention to the monastic readership, to the copies and the reading practices. As we saw, the uh, one person, Thomas of Ustad, was responsible for both copying the Arabic and reusing to Syriac manuscripts. So um, I think that's it's quite telling. So we, we are dealing with uh, quite a small um, uh, group of, of monks interested in these texts and reusing these manuscripts. Uh, but then at the same time, we should look also at the broader Mediterranean context, uh, Byzantium, uh, but also the Latin West and the Islamic and Jewish uh, context. Um, thank you and sorry for taking too long. I look forward to the discussion.